as you know, the theme of this year's TEDx UTSC talk is Dare to Know, an aspiration expressed in the following. Thriving and progressing in this unpredictable world is about self-discovery that complements one's ability to accept and acknowledge all that is unfamiliar. And I want to play with this aspiration a little bit. I want to move from the idea of unfamiliarity as a lack to an intentional space that we embody for the purpose of raising unexpected, unanticipated, and possibly uncomfortable questions about what we know and how we know. I want to talk about unknowing as a process and as a way of life. Now, as I'm using the term, unknowing isn't not knowing. It's not ignorance or indifference to knowledge. And it's not a suggestion that knowledge itself is an impossibility. Rather, it's an intentional interrogation of our own knowledge, the things that we take for granted, the things that we don't question because we're confident in our certainty that we know. And we tend to think of knowledge as this solid and stable, sturdy, attainable thing. And we don't often think about the fact that knowledge, the development of knowledge, includes both a building up and a tearing down, a fostering of the new and a rejection of the old. But it's also worth asking why we held that previous information as knowledge. What ideologies or biases might have been part of that knowledge, how those might have remained part of our broader repertoire of knowledge even after we've rejected or set aside those ideas, and what ramifications this has in the way we view ourselves and the way we view others in the world. Now, I started to think about knowledge and what it means to know at a rather early age. Uh, I was something of a smart kid in primary and secondary school, and I recall uh, an instance of some light bullying that took place. Most smart kids know this tends to come with the territory, and I was in about grade five when a group of my peers approached me, and one girl sneering at me in that way that only preteens seem able to sneer says, you think you're so smart do you think you know everything? And I remember thinking about the question for a minute before responding, and when I did reply, my answer was, well, no, of course not. No one can know everything. There's too much to know. And I realized today that that's a very smart kid answer, and it didn't do much to diffuse the situation or increase my popularity or acceptance in any way, but it did prompt a moment of curiosity for me. It allowed me to start thinking about what the limits to knowledge are and what it means to pursue knowledge even while not acknowledging that complete knowledge might be an impossibility. What does it mean to aspire towards something that we can never fully attain? Now today, I have one of the best jobs in the world partly due to being that smart kid all those years ago, as a scholar and an educator in a number of humanities disciplines, I'm intensely invested in thinking about how we develop knowledge, how we critique knowledge. And one of the ways that I do that with my students is to get them asking questions. Again, often unfamiliar, somewhat uncomfortable questions. And I'll be doing a lot of that today as well, perhaps raising more questions than I answer but that's okay. I think that the questioning itself is the point, right? The point is the process. I don't want to give you answers. I want you to come to those on your own. And so one of the first questions that I ask my freshman undergrads to ask is the question being asked here. What does it mean to know? Or better, um, what are we claiming when we're claiming to have knowledge? When we say that we know something, are we suggesting that we have deep and intimate familiarity with every nuance and detail of a particular theory, idea, or event? Are we claiming mere passing familiarity? Oh, I know that. Are we expressing a degree of certainty? Or better, are we able to acknowledge that the knowledge we developed is always constructed within a particular 
context, and often a mediated context, because knowledge always comes to us from others, of course. And these aren't really new questions. The branch of philosophy known as epistemology asks precisely these kinds of questions. What's the possible scope of knowledge? What are the potential limitations of knowledge? And to what extent can we claim to know anything? And we don't often have the opportunity to ask these kinds of questions in our everyday lives. And the university ideally is one of the few social spaces where space is made for this kind of reflection, but these aren't purely academic questions. They aren't merely academic questions. The way that we respond to these questions, the degree to which we think through these kinds of things, has repercussions for how we view ourselves and others with whom we share the world. And hopefully that'll become clear as I go through my talk today. Now, knowledge can very broadly be defined as information processed through a thinking mind. But it's worth considering for a moment how we come across that information, how it's processed, and what unnoticed or unintended biases, ideologies, worldviews might come along in tow. So there are two primary ways that we obtain information about the world. The first is somatically. And this is direct sensory perception. This is our unmediated, sensual engagement with the external world. But it actually makes up a very small percent of the overall information we take in about the world. Rather, the vast amount of information that we receive comes to us symbolically, through some medium or another, indirectly. And again, we don't often think about this, but if we take a moment to think through all of the different sources of information we engage on a daily basis, this easily becomes quite clear. Parents, teachers, friends, professors, books, television, the internet, newspapers, et cetera, et cetera, all of these things are mediators. They are indirect channels for knowledge. But when we're talking about that kind of indirect channel, when we're talking about mediation, there's always a subjective element to that information. It's coming to us through someone else's lens and then being processed by our own. And so it's worth interrogating that information and the knowledge that we develop from it to see if those hidden or unnoticed biases have come along and how we might act to correct those in our everyday lives. So I want to give an example of a process of unknowing that I went through in my own life so that I can show that this isn't a set of questions merely reserved for the so-called ivory tower of academia. This kind of questioning goes beyond the walls of the educational institution and into our fundamental perceptions. So I grew up in the United States. And for the first 18 years of my life, I lived in a trailer park in a rural farm town. And for part of my undergrad, I ended up moving to a rather rough neighborhood in uh, one of the bigger cities in my state. And this was an area marked by poverty, strict division between economic classes, facilitated by the loss of manufacturing jobs as factories closed their doors, as has been characteristic of the first few decades of the 21st century. And now I wasn't naive, I was already something of a critical thinker in my younger days, but I was still educated within a particular context. And it was a context that insisted that if you just work hard enough, you will succeed. It's the maxim of the American dream, said to be achievable by anyone and everyone. And I'd been somewhat critical of this, but I hadn't unknown it fully. I hadn't had the opportunity to dig through that ideology and see just how deeply it affects our perceptions. So I'm living in this neighborhood and I'm seeing my neighbors working hard working harder than I'd ever seen anyone work in my life, working 12 to 16 hours a day, seven days a week, working overtime, working multiple jobs, working to feed their children, working to be attentive parents while juggling everything else. And still, despite working so hard, they weren't succeeding as we typically 
consider success. Many of them were barely scraping by, and many of their lives were marked by loss. And living this reality and trying to live in solidarity with those who were living in poverty was very different from reading or waxing philosophical about poverty, racism, gender inequality, things like this. And so this was a process of really nuanced evaluation for me because if so prevalent a worldview as the American dream, something which has permeated far beyond the borders of this one particular country, something that's considered by many to be mere common sense, if this can hide so much more than it reveals about the actual lives of people, if it obscures so much more than it illuminates, what does that say about the other things that we take for granted? Our other assumptions, the other parts of an ideology that we don't interrogate, particularly when it's just part and parcel of the culture or the community in which we grow up. And so these were deeply formative years for me, and they very much inspired me to continue trying to ask these kinds of questions, to look at the assumptions that I have, pull them apart, turn them on their heads, shake them around a little bit to see what falls out. And so it's that same process that I now try to encourage in my own students. Because the ways that we do or don't ask these questions, the ways that we do or don't respond to them, affects how we see others in the world, right? Because, of course, the stigma with regard to the people uh, I lived with was that if they weren't succeeding, well, then they weren't working hard enough. But, of course, I saw that that was very clearly not the case. And so I encourage us to sort of probe those assumptions as much as we can and to look at our knowledge in different ways to destabilize our knowledge, to take everything that seems clear to us and make it blurry, even just for the purpose of engaging in that ter interrogation. Maybe we come back to the same answers that we went in with. That's fine. The point is the process. The point is asking those questions, even if they're unfamiliar, even if they make us uncomfortable, or perhaps especially if they make us uncomfortable because when we're uncomfortable, we're likely about to learn something. And so storytellers are really great at using symbolic transmission to help us think differently about a variety of concepts. And this is no different when science fiction author James P. Blaylock says, to learn the truth is to make things fall apart. Knowledge is not a cement, a wall of order against chaos, it is an infinitude of little cracks running in a thousand directions, threatening to crumble into fragments our firmest convictions. And I came across this quote completely by chance. Serendipitously, a friend shared it on social media as I was putting this talk together. So I might be deep, uh, problematically decontextualizing it, but I just can't help how much I love this image of what knowledge is because it shatters our vision of knowledge as this stable and sturdy, sustainable thing. All knowledge has cracks and fissures, and when the truth results in things falling apart, we need to dig through that rubble and see what's left over and understand that new knowledge is always erected upon the rubble of past knowledge. So we need to dig through that. We need to see what kind of foundation we're leaving for that new knowledge, right? Are there hidden biases? Are there hidden worldviews that maybe we don't agree with or that we feel we need to reckon with more? And let's ask questions to explore that before we try to erect this new, supposedly stable knowledge. And so one of the things that I try to emphasize to my students is that certainty is a trap. Certainty marks the end of critical reflection because if I'm certain of something, what need is there to interrogate it further? Certainty is very comfortable in a painfully uncertain world. 
right? We're all grasping for sense and meaning in a seemingly senseless and potentially meaningless world. And so certainty allows us to feel like we're on stable grounds, like we have things figured out. But that's where we miss those biases. That's where we overlook those ideologies. And so I encourage my students and all of you, at least for a while, to try to embrace instability. Embrace unknowing rather than knowing. Embrace deconstructing your own knowledge rather than focusing only on how that knowledge can be constructed higher and higher and higher. And again, this isn't always comfortable, but it's almost always worth it. And this seems like a sort of weird way to go through life, embracing instability, rejecting certainty unknowing more so than knowing, but I promise if you practice it enough, it becomes uh, more second nature than you'd think. Now even I, of course, have, I'm so sure, all sorts of unexamined biases and ideologies that need further excavation, but having practiced this way of thinking for so long, I do it without even thinking about it, and it just occurred to me last night that it's exactly what I had done with this particular project when the TEDx representatives came to me and said, well, the theme is dare to know. My first thought was, hmm, well, what about unknowing? What happens if we take this idea, dare to know, turn it on its head, shake it around, see what falls out, and thus a TED Talk was born. So dare to know, absolutely, but also dare to unknow, dare to question the very foundations of everything you think you know about the world. Dare to think about the way that you receive information and to consider the possibility that the information you receive carried with it the worldviews, values, and biases of someone else. Dare to question whether these are your worldviews, values, beliefs, etc and dare to at least entertain the possibility that they are not, and use that possibility to interrogate and potentially unknow the knowledge that you have. Thank you.